be assured that the sea of the sky is full of souls who are ready to help us. Uh, I want to continue with the website sharing some of the other dreams that he had, one in particular that relates to macrobiotics uh, and to um, a plant-based diet. He really believed in the power of compassion and thinking about others was access to power. Maybe that's why politicians are who they are. They, they get the power, but they're really not necessarily compassionate. He wanted to start something he called the Spoons in the Grains Society. And he felt this was important so that people could discover this uh, energy source of grain as the crystallized energy of the sun. And the sun's power and energy was locked into the the atomic bonds in the carbon atom in a carbohydrate form. And that when we ate this food, this energy was released in us. And this was a divine uh, understanding that he had. So he had a, another dream, kind of his final project that he talked to me about. And he had many of them over the years that he was looking at seeding for me to begin that I sometimes feel guilty that I, I let him down. Uh, but it was as though he wanted me to stop doing what I was doing in my life and start taking uh, care of these projects. But the Spoons and the Grains project is meant to get a very mouth creamy feel he would talk about of, of grain, kind of a rice cream or a grain cream that could be flavored with different uh, vegetable purees. And as Sherry had put it, a kind of a, you know, a macrobiotic ensure, something that you could eat that would really just be, give you good energy, it would be alkalizing, it would be delicious, and it could be produced in massive quantities for, for the good of, of people and the divine that is in them and in their bodies. Um, so I, I'm going to be sharing these things on the website. I don't know how things are going to unfold in my own life. I am an active architect and uh, builder and teacher. Um, but he really wanted me at one point to stop what I was doing and go visit the Lundbergs and Chico and uh, help them with their uh, organic farming technology, as he put it, and take it around the world. He really saw the world through the lens of a grain of brown rice. Uh, he was obsessed with brown rice. <laughs> he loved it. So does anyone else have something that they want to share and maybe not have the, the echoey effect? Yeah. What we're going to do, um, let me just light the candles, Matt, and then... Um, because he liked rice, we're gonna just light some candles. We have, let your light shine. <laughs> and um, just light a candle for him. So who am I seeing here? I know that's, that's Denny. Mm -hmm. Hi. Mm -hmm. And who else? I'm here, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear Matt? Matt? Hi, I see Simon. Hello. 
I knew him between uh, 82 and 83. So I was a, I'm a contemporary of Bill Brame and uh, Jay Verspeak. Did you have anything you wanted to share, Simon? Um, well, he and I smoked a lot of cigarettes in the middle of the night in the architecture school. And um, he would always come in. Uh, I was in summer school. Everybody else had gone off to different parts of the world. I think they'd gone to India and Japan. And I was living in, uh, I had to stay in Philadelphia because of um, the terms of my scholarship. I couldn't leave the States. So I had to spend the summer in Philadelphia. And it was very, very hot. So I moved into the architecture studio because of the air conditioning and because the building because it's a concrete frame building it would keep its temperature in the middle of the night or throughout the night so i made myself a sort of makeshift apartment in the studio which of course was perfect for gabor because when the library closed at 12 then he would come into the architecture school Oh. And then we would, and every night, um, without failure, I'd hear these um, particular footsteps. I don't know whether you remember. He was, um, he had leather-soled shoes, which made a particular sound. And so he would come in on the dot. Well, it was always about sort of one minute past twelve. Um, and then we would just talk about what I'd been working on. And he would, he had various techniques which he used. And one of, one of the ones he used to get me to do was to, um, stand on the opposite side of the studio to where I was working, face the wall, and then explain the project without being able to look at what was being, what I'd drawn. And he would, um, his argument, or oh, it wasn't really an argument, his, his philosophy was that if you could if you could explain something without looking at it, then it gave you a, um, it forced you to um, understand or begin or to try and understand what the essence of the thing was and what was the most important thing about it. Mm. Um, and so I used to try, I used to get him to do exactly the same. So when we'd been talking about what I'd been working on, I'd get him to go and stand and look, look at the wall and then he could tell me what he thought was important about it. Mm. And I have to say that some of the things he came out with were extremely amusing. <laughs> um, but I think the, by far the most important thing, and I spent, I was in the studio for about eight weeks, I think, so I had consistent conversations with him every evening. Mm. And the, he basically taught me to think in a, in a, in a, in a way that nobody else had, had, had um, taught me before in terms of just trying to get to the bottom of what the essence of something is. Um, and I think that's, you know, absolutely stayed with me throughout my career. Mm. Um, and I saw him, I've been, when I've come, come back to Philadelphia, I sort of saw him a couple of times. I didn't see him the last time I was there. But he has stayed with me. Um, 
And I think there's something that's, uh, because I obviously saw him a very long time ago, I think the, but even at the time, I think what's important is that the, in a way, the idea of what he represented was in a way more powerful than any 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 moment that you might have had with him mm. because i think that there's a what he had is this aura and the sort of notion that he was about to say something that would would undoubtedly be very profound in its own particular and obscure way. And I suppose in a sense that that is the, um, the power of, 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 to me, that was the power of him as a person. It, it, it was because a lot of, sometimes he would say some of the most ridiculous things. Mm -hmm. Um, and and he would go on and on about um, something because I was I mean you all know much better than I did but because you've spent much longer with him but I think it's to me it's the it's it's the idea of what he was about to say that 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 gives it uh, or certainly from my point of view um, made what he did say a lot more powerful. Mm. That was nice. Sorry, it's in the middle of the night in London. <laughs> and I had to put my alarm on to... Uh, <laughs> to come up. <laughs> to get up. <laughs> well, thank you, Simon. That's Denny, all right. Did you have anything you wanted to say, Denny, um, before we move on? Um... I'm sure I have something to say. I wanted to listen for a while. Okay. I'm trying to collect my thoughts. Um, I've known him, I think, since 1969. So I've known him for a while, but um, I'm still collecting my thoughts. So okay. I, okay. Um, I just didn't want to cut you off. No, anyone, thank you. anyone else want to uh, unmute themselves and share a story? I, I'll i share a little bit. I. Um, he would call me a lot and just talk, you know, about um, the significance of grains and teaching, you know, macrobiotics and how important it was, especially in this day and time. And um, I put up on the website, I set Matt, my last phone conversation with him. We were talking about how to um, communicate with God. And like Matt and Simon had said, he was so profound and so deep, you know, he'd leave, he'd leave these messages on my phone about, you know, the, the stars and the universe and, um, you know, so they'd always be very thought provoking to me. And he would come to some of my cooking classes and he'd always stand up and reprimand anybody who was talking during the class or um, you know, getting up and leaving early or whatever and saying how important these teachings are and um, to show, you know, your deepest respect for them. So I always felt like he was sort of like a cheerleader for all of us in macrobiotics. And, um, you know, although he never himself did a lot of the projects, he was always trying to promote or push us all to work harder in um, getting the messages across. So I, um, I really loved him and I, I grew to like really appreciate his input. Uh, but like Matt said, sometimes he was a little abrupt. He had, I was caring for my parents and he one time called my, me and my mom had uh, listened in on the other end of the line and he was shouting at me to put her in a nursing home that she's taking up all my time and I should be teaching more. And once she heard that <laughs> message, she never let him call the house again for a while. So um, 
he did have his moments where he would just speak his mind, no matter, you know, sometimes how harsh it was. Um, but I just um, really appreciated our conversations. I, can... uh, I wanted to say something. Oh, sorry. Mary? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I can wait. Well, I was just going to comment on something that Simon said, that Gabor sometimes described himself as a, as a person who was a seeker of essence. That he really wanted to get at the essence of things, and he wanted to express essence and so it was interesting that Simon's story of the walking across the room and facing the wall to describe the essence of your project was was really his lifelong thing it really said so much about who he was and how he tried to express essence yeah I like that story Simon um, Mary did you want to go Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you all and celebrate this wonderful man. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So I have uh, my recollection more is back in maybe 78, 79, that area of time. And uh, I think I was living at the study house with Denny and Judy. And he used to really get after Judy because he wanted her to do something with the, um, the um, Campbell Soup Company. And I'm not, you know, he just had big visions, um, very big, big. And I think he had connected already with Campbell Soup Company. And, you know, he wanted her to be able to produce something because she was so, such a good cook. And he just was pushing, pushing, pushing. And, and, and for some reason, I could never figure out how he did it. But he zoned in, he would zone in on like who you were. And he found out from me that I had been raised by a family. My father was a renderer. And that meant that they uh, made a business out of like boiling animals to render their fat. And so I told, I somehow he managed to get that out of me and I don't, I, but we ended up having this conversation, a long conversation about that. And he told me that that was why I became, I gave up eating animal food because I had to pay for all the sins of my family. I mean, he went into this deep, you know, um, uh, point of view that I had just not thought of. And I never, ever forgot that. And I thought, yeah, I am paying for all that animals the, that got killed on behalf of the profit, I guess, that the, my family made. I don't know. But he really, how he found that out, I mean, who knows that? You know, who ever, but he, he zoned in on that. And he, I thought he was so astute. But uh, the thing about him most was he just was relentless. I mean, he would call and he'd get you on the phone and, you know, you just were like, oh my God, who does this? You know, that was how he was. But he was very lovable and uh, a, an extraordinary human being, and his insight to everything was amazing. So it was a little hard, I think, because he was so different. You know, he just, the stuff he came up with, like Sherry saying, and all of you guys, uh, Simon, I mean, you had a very interesting experience with him. And it was just, a, and he was an extraordinary person. So I'm happy to be here, celebrate his life. Even though I didn't know him recently, I did have a lot of experience with him back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And he, he's so memorable. How could you ever not remember him and honor him? So I, I bless him and wish him well in his next life. Rest in peace, Gabor. You're a sweetheart. And he gave me a lot because he made me realize what I, I, you know, I just had the um, sense to stop eating meat so early in my life and he he told me so you're 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 paying for all of that that they've done and uh, all of my family still eat meat so you know I'm one of eight siblings so what are you going to do you know <laughs>
Anyway, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. uh, here I thank you. Matt, didn't you have the same experience with your parents? <laughs> uh, yeah, he, uh, no, I, got, I guess I gotta use my phone. Um, yeah, he, he had this understanding of karma, again, kind of at the cellular level. And my family was involved with, with growing um, peaches, and they had a peach cannery, which, of course, involved sugar. So at the other end of the spectrum from meat, I had this uh, karma. He almost considered to me to be part of a drug crime family. <laughs> and he felt that I, I had a lot of karmic repair to do. It's part of the reason that he wanted me to get involved with um, rice because of its balanced nature. Um, he just understood everybody on these invisible realms of karma and, and family um, and the psyche these these underlying realms i was having a conversation with, with david rulon that both of us met him at a time in our lives when we had just experienced uh, some extreme heartache and anguish and i think he read that in people he was so intuitive and of course could read body language and what have you but he seemed drawn i know to me because i was in a time of my life there in the studio and i Another thing that Simon had said, you know, rang true to me, that, that he was at the library every night, and then he would walk through the studio, and I remember those footsteps, and it meant that he was there, and he would, uh, he was um, a pretty heavy smoker. I don't know how much that came into play with his lung issues late um, in these last couple of years, um, but the the whole karmic understanding that he had. You know, he really, really went after uh, my ancestry. He felt it was very good. I some of my own insights into him, because his on his grand on his mother's father's side, they apparently were a very successful um, soap making industry in Hungary. They became very wealthy. And so they, they made all this money in soap and was part of the reason that their family was targeted by the Soviets because they were after anyone that had wealth. So his family, besides his father being uh, a physician, his mother's family was involved in the soap industry. And his story was that the recipe for soap came through the Bayer family of Bayer aspirin and Bayer, you know, multi-billion dollar multinational corporation now that that family had passed on the soap recipe to his mother's uh, father's side of the family and that, that they, they had this great fortune. So he was obsessed with wealth and people that had been successful. He was always talking to me about uh, trying to be like Steve Jobs or, or Bill Gates or somebody. Um, he he very much himself, I didn't understand why he wasn't a wealthy man, but he chose, he said, out of compassion to live this simpler life. And he also admitted that in the social realm that he was, he knew that he was kind of awkward and was never going to really be a, an especially social person. But he very much was active one-on-one. -on -one. He was a powerful person. Would anyone else like to share something? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, this is kind of a, a jumble. So I think the first time I saw it, so I started my story in 69 in Sansa Village. It's Danny Waxman, by the way. And Gabor came in there a couple of times. I never knew him. We never spoke. But later when I met him, I remembered just his appearance was unmistakable. 
And like many people said, he had two sides. One was very endearing, encouraging, and the other was totally encouraging. And um, he would push me so hard sometimes to do things that I, I couldn't do and didn't want to do. And I actually cut him off for about 10 years. I, I wouldn't take a call. I, I wouldn't talk to him. I was just like I said, this is enough. But, okay, the other side is he gave me many good ideas that I've acted on that, that have changed my life. One of the first ones was the power of the basic four, how that um, changed society and food consciousness and everything and how, how damaging that was. I, I've, I've run with that many times. Um, speaking of Judy, so Judy Waxman, my ex-wife, also Hungarian, she was a very powerful woman. She was only afraid of one person on this planet, and that was Gabor. Gabor, on the other hand, as far as I know, was only afraid of one person on this planet, and that was Judy. So they both had this powerful psychic ability to read in and see through people that was like, it was daunting. And uh, I, I guess they butted heads, when, but I know from talking to both of them, they, um, yeah, both had, I, I, I guess, a fear and respect of each other. Um, at a particularly low point of my life, Gabor called me up and said, this person is trying to destroy you. I said, are you figurative or literal? He says, literal, he knocked on the table like that, literal, like concrete. And he said, you need a bodyguard. That's what he told me. He said, you need protection. You need a bodyguard. It was after like a long time. Okay, you need a therapist. So I said, okay. He says, I'm going to give you three names. He said, you need a therapist, therapist. The therapist that was, the therapist gets into trouble. They have therapists they go to. And these are three names. So I called the first one on the list. I like the guy's voice. And we just hit it off on the phone. And I went to see him. It was one of the best things in my life because we became good friends. And he helped me greatly in my career because he kept telling me, I need to tell you how to listen. You're not, you know, I told him, you're not, you're not hearing. I need to teach you how to listen to people. And it made a major difference in my life and my counseling ability. And we're still friends today. Every once in a while, I just call him up to say hi and, you know, how you doing? And at, at any rate. Um, he was always pushing me. So once I came up with Strength in the Health to start the campaign, Strengthen Your Health in America, Strengthen Your Health in Europe, I tried it for a while, I dropped it, but recently we decided to pick up that idea again, which he gave me back in the, in the late 90s. Strengthen Your Health in America campaign, which I'm, I'm thinking of, of picking up now. The obsession with um, Rich people, he's always giving me names. You have to contact this person, this person will help you. And I tried for a while and it was, it was all useless. He used to tell me, I was like the Steve Jobs type person, a billionaire frozen in an ice cube. I guess I'm still frozen because uh, <laughs> no, nothing's changed since then. Then the, the last thing, um, that really comes to mind for the last number of years, you know, speaking of spiritual, because yes, his spiritual essence and connections and acronyms were always wonderful. I still have a lot of his, his acronyms on my phone. Every time I he'd give me another ac acronym, I put it in my contact card just for consideration for the, for the future. But uh, the last number of, oh, be before that, uh, Colin Campbell went to speak at UPenn. So Susan and I went to hear him speak and Gabor was there and Gabor came up near the end of this and he said, ask him a question. So he says, yes, stand up now and ask him a question. Said, okay, of course I stood up. <laughs> and I said, what am I gonna ask him? So I said, okay, Dr. Colin, because we were good friends. I said, is there any science behind um, gluten intolerance or gluten allergies. He said, no, there's no science whatsoever. Danny, you've been in this game for a long time. What are your thoughts? 
So then he, he threw it back at me and I, I gave my talk. And I just looked after it. It couldn't have been better timing. But the last thing I'd, I'd like to say, the last number of years were New Year's. One other thing. Um, Judy, no, Melanie, my ex-wife, had a, a party out in Lionville. And he didn't have a way of get, getting there. And we gave him a ride. And really, it was um, a very, very interesting time of another uh, important conversation of just insights into people and things. But the last number of years, when New Year's, he would call me up and he would thank me for what I do and thank me in the name of all the people who never thank me and the spirits in the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. It was behind me and to be aware of that. And when Matthew was talking or uh, whoever was mentioning that, I just thought that was really an important part of the message to me. So um, he was definitely a, a unique person. I feel very blessed um, to have known him. Sometimes I felt very like pushed, like I said, no more, it's enough. <clears throat> and uh, some ways I feel bad that I probably <clears throat> was not there enough for him as he was for me, but um, I really uh, value him as a friend and um, I love seeing this photo. It really, it really captures his spirit, that, that, you know, joyful, loving spirit. And thank you for having us. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dan. One other really quick thing. Um, he was so psychic and one, uh, this just happened recently. The last phone call he made, you know, we were talking on the phone. I couldn't understand him too well because he had his oxygen going, but I could understand him enough to write things down. And my niece was dropping off her cat, you know, for me to watch. And <laughs> he didn't even know this, but as we were on the phone, he says, don't spend your time babysitting her cat. You got better things to do. And I'm like, how in the world did he ever know that? You know, she was dropping the cat off. So he was very, at times, extremely psychic and rare. Anybody else have something they'd like to share? Um, what, what are we going to do to commemorate Gabor? Uh, I wanted to share that I've created a website for him. Mm -hmm. And the website, uh, GaborSalante.com is a place to share stories. I've got photographs. I've got some, uh, blog entries and I want to continue building on those. I've got three decades worth of stories and notes that I feel obligated to him to uh, mm -hmm. put out there and have them uh, continue. So uh, Gabor Salante .com is a place to uh, commemorate him. He additionally uh, wanted a stone to be engraved with um, his uh, his seven words, uh, the realms of of uh, light and joy. And I should have these memorized, but well, the the the, the seven words the, the the seven words changed a lot. So so don't feel bad about it. Yeah. Well, the seven words um, that he gave me originally was five words, and he added two more, and they were advance, elevate, better, develop, perfect, improve, and renew. It's kind of positive, creative, 
and, and words about innovation, which was very much what he was about. And so that stone, I, um, you know, may ask to have help financially. It's going to cost a couple thousand. Uh, I may put together a, a GoFundMe and just if anyone has anything to put towards that. Aaron Johnson, I don't know if Aaron is here. Uh, if, where, uh, where, where, where is Gabor buried? Where, where is Gabor going to be buried? Do, do, you, do you know? Well, she has his remains. She just told me today that she got his ashes at the post office. It was an interesting uh, anecdote that she had. So he has been cremated. That was what he wanted. Uh, he wanted his ashes placed somewhere where they would be nutrients for a tree or for plants. He loved trees. There is an animation that one of his students who lives in India, uh, Gautam Bhatia, I believe is his name, and I'll have to excuse me if I'm not pronouncing it right, but Gautam put together this lovely animation that I put on, um, on the website on the obituary page. And uh, Gabor wanted his ashes to be placed where, where a tree could draw its nu nutrients from, from his, those remains. He didn't specify a place, but I've been talking with Aaron about a place to put those ashes and to place this stone as, as uh, something to, to commemorate him. And the website is meant to be a living memorial where we can continue to share stories and piece together his life. I've reached out to some other people that knew him earlier in his life that I'm hoping to get other photographs of him as a young man. I mean, of the years I've known him, I, I never had a picture of him. He was always really weird about that, not wanting someone to somehow feed off his energy or whatever his concern was. It was almost like um, some aboriginal societies where taking your picture was stealing your soul and and uh I, he kind of alluded that he didn't want his picture taken he didn't want to be um he really didn't care whether there was a memorial or not this is for us and uh he really felt very strongly about what what he believed in and that's part of what i want to keep out there to commemorate him with the website to be shared and to kind of introduce these things and all these realms of, of who those of us who are gathered here all represent these different facets of him and uh i've just had the good fortune to speak with him over many many years and have a lot of notes and stories of my own that certainly we all overlap. We have an interesting Venn diagram we could make here <laughs> in the in the architectural and design realm, in, in the certainly in the macrobiotic realm, um, is, um, and in the, is, in, the, in the spiritual realm. Is Aaron on the call now? No, I don't think so. No, and, she couldn't make it. And 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 what what is Aaron to to Gabor? What was Aaron to Gabor? I would say a good friend. And and yeah, yeah his and his re his remains were left to her. Uh yes. Uh, she's taking care <laughs> of his apartment and mail and, um, you know the the kind of items that need to be taken care of. And did she not want to join us tonight? Um, she has a, um, she had to take care of her daughter tonight. Yeah, um, that's, that's why I asked for this press. to be recorded. What's that? That's why I had asked for this to be recorded because I think she would really um, enjoy kind of hearing everyone's um, well, you know, positive messages and, you know, sharing their experiences. I didn't want her to miss out on this. So that's great that you're recording it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send so, it to everyone tomorrow. So Steph, I, this is Matt. Hi. 
Hi. Um, Aaron had mentioned you, so you're going to somehow help a little bit with getting his place cleaned out? Um, yeah, we there's a kind of little to-do list that we have, so we're going to work together to try to get some of that done. Okay. Uh, because I had been in touch with the property manager and the, the landlord, and uh, Gabor left me a message on Friday, on the day that he left us, that he wanted to make sure that his rent was paid for a couple of months. Months He um, was concerned about his heart, and he said, if anything happens to me, he had given me a couple phone numbers. So... Uh, one of the phone numbers was the property manager and the manager and the other phone number was for Sarto uh, Schickel and Sarto was a, had been a student at Penn who Gabor knew and trusted and he had given Sarto a key and had asked Sarto to come check on him and Sarto was the one that discovered him. Uh, his bio pajama as he called it. Mm -hmm. So uh, cleaning this place out, I understand it's pretty cluttered. Uh, he lived across the street from me for, I lived across the street from him over, over a year and he never invited me up. I think he was very private that way. I don't think he was a good housekeeper. Um, <laughs> He was very much in his head and in his demand of, of the mind and uh, the physical world was a bit of a struggle for him. So, uh, I, but I imagine that there are piles and stacks of notebooks, um, possibly sketchbooks, certainly books, artwork, possibly some photographs, a photograph of his father that he talked to me about. He said he had a little, had a little shrine uh, to rice I know that he was, uh, again, being obsessed with rice and how he cooked it, that he was doing these experiments with brown rice and making it alkaline because he said it was slightly acidic. And he, he really was aware of this acid alkaline balance thing and was working on uh, alkalized rice as a, as a process that he was thinking would become an industrial process to create a product. Mm -hmm. out of brine rice that would be an alkalizing um, food. And he had, he showed me one day, he came across the street and he showed me this, these notes that he had taken and, and I, he had taken pieces of yellow paper together. And I think that this set of notes was probably you know, 10, 12 feet long. Uh, of, of all these experiments and his uh, very careful lettering. You know, these things are probably just things that most people would want to throw away. I know that I would like to have a oh, uh, hey. of his life. I've been listening this whole time because I don't know how to, you know, I'm only on my phone and I don't know how to do anything. This is David Rulon and I talk with Matt a few times about Gabor. Uh, mostly I have just a, a number of funny stories that I'll share on the website. And I also have a, uh, a lovely drawing of his that I've had hanging above my computer pretty much since I moved to California. And I, I, I will, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to photograph it without the reflection on it. But uh, he was quite a, a very unique person and, and totally enjoyed talking to him. And uh, I'm sorry he is gone. He, he did leave me a, a voicemail about a week before he died. And um, that's actually one of the funny stories that I will share. Um, so it's great, it's great to hear all, all these stories from people. I hope uh, more people will be able to share their stories as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to share for just a quick minute. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Stephanie. And I had met, um, he had introduced himself to me as Gabriel. So I, I go by the name Gabriel, but um, I had met him back in 2001 at the um, Fairmount Park in Philadelphia where he used to spend a lot of time walking and kind of sitting under a particular tree and talking to people. And I 
was kind of just sitting there reading a book, minding my own business. And this man comes up to me and he's like walking his bike and he was a bit disheveled. And I just remember getting a little scared because, you know, he's coming over to me. He's trying to start conversation and, you know, I am being polite, but eventually after like a few minutes, he's like, come, come for a walk with me. And I was like, uh, no, no, thank you. I'm okay. But something made me get out of my chair and go for a walk with this man. And we walked to where he liked to sit under a particular tree. And eight hours later, <laughs> um, I remember leaving thinking, I learned more about life in those eight hours than I did in 16 hours, I mean, excuse me, 16 years of going to school. Um, I was in a place in my life where I was going through a spiritual growth period. And at the time, I'm not even sure I, I knew the wording around that. And it kind of just reminds me of that saying that when the student is ready, the teacher comes. And he just came at the right time. And I, um, he really did have such a huge impact on my life and my spiritual growth. And I remember for years, I would just, I wouldn't even call him by name if I was talking to my family about him. I would just call him my soul teacher, you know? And like many of you, he would, you know, call and, you know, sometimes there were long conversations. And I remember certain times where the phone would ring and I would just dread picking it up. <laughs> but something always made me work through that resistance and pick it up. And by the time that phone call ended, I would hang up and I'd be like, I am so glad I picked up that phone. Um, so I just feel blessed that I had a chance to have him in my life, you know, even if it was for a short time. I haven't seen him in a couple of years. He's the one that actually introduced me to Aaron and Aaron and I end up, you know, living together and being roommates for a while. And of course, we're still good friends. Um, so again, I just thank you for putting this together. It's It's really nice to be able to you know, share some stories about him and, you know, remember some of the funny times and uh, good times and amazing conversations that we had. And um, just the last thing I wanted to say, one of the things that always stands out that we joke about me, Aaron, and one of my cousins who also knew him was at least for a time period, he not only was he obviously into brown rice, but also carrot juice. So I don't know if any of you knew him during his carrot juice days, but you know, his skin would be kind of like tinted orange. <laughs> um, so that was like a big joke that we always like laughed about. And he passed away uh, on a Friday. And on Saturday I had gone to the supermarket and I never buy carrot juice. I never buy carrot juice. I picked up carrot juice, um, bought some and automatically just thought of him. Mm -hmm. And it was the next day that I found out that he had passed away. So I kind of feel like in some little way he was connecting with me, you know, at that time, close to his transition. So thank you, everyone. It's nice to meet you all as well. Thank you. I just, I just thought of some, another story that's kind of cute. Uh, one time he wanted me to meet him on the UPenn campus and we walked around and found a balcony and he wanted to do a radio broadcast to the universe. So he was interviewing me and we were talking about brown rice and macrobiotics and basically changing the world. And this was the, you know, he was very serious about this. And it was actually very moving, it was very powerful, our radio broadcast to the universe. So, <laughs> um, memorable stories. Um, well, it's very nice to meet, it's very nice to meet all of you. I'm, 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 um, I introduced myself. I'm sorry. I'm on an Island in Maine. So I'm just on a, on a phone here, not on the zoom call. I was on the zoom call earlier. I'm Nathaniel Khan. So I'm Lou's, Lou Khan's son. And I met Gabor when I was a little boy. Um, so I knew him all of my life and, um, he's a wonderful presence in my life. Um, as clearly he was for everybody there. And so I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm getting a little sense of what the plans are for the future, but it seems like they're sort of worlds. Gabor had a number of worlds and they didn't all connect. And we're sort of, some of us are connecting on this call. And I think it would be very nice to stay in touch in the sense that I think he had such a rich uh, relationship, set of relationships in the macrobiotic world and the food world. And I certainly remember 
many of his conversations about wanting to heal the world through mm-hmm. through macrobiotics and through brown rice and had many funny experiences when he showed up at our house and we didn't have any brown rice and all we had was some bird seed. So we cooked some millet for him once from the bird seed and he was very happy with that. Um, but, um, it, you know, he was, as we all know, a remarkable human being. But I, one thing I'd love to say is that, you know, I know he had, because I saw his place, he, he had a lot of things there. Um, and um, from the standpoint of, of, you know, where I, where I am, certainly connected and I think Bill Whitaker is still on the call here and Gina Polera is on the call and maybe David Leatherborough is even on the call but a number of his friends from Penn are on the call here and uh, we would love to see some kind of a commemoration for Gabor um, in the archives or somewhere at Penn and certainly uh, one of the things we all wondered about always is um, Gabor's drawing abilities, which we knew he had, but he really didn't share them very much. And there were many stories in my dad's office about, you know, Gabor worked in the office in in a sort of tangential way, but really as a philosopher. And I remember my father and he talking late at night about ideas. And sometimes people who had to get work done were completely experienced that with great consternation because Lou was not working. He was talking to Gabor. And Gabor did work on a couple of projects, but apparently his drawings were extremely small and very faint and were often done with a, a piece of, you know, raw lead sort of thing that was so faint that you couldn't kind of present it to anybody. But I always heard tell the drawings were very beautiful, um, but I never, I've never seen one. So huh. I think that one thing we would love to do, obviously, those of you who are part of his, you know, estate and taking care of those things, you'll come across a lot of material. We would really love it if we could, uh, in some way, in the appropriate way, share some of those things with, um, with, a, with a wider audience. So if you come across those drawings or those thoughts or those ideas, I think we'd, we, would, we would love to stay in touch with you and see if we can't do something commemorative for him um, at Penn or in some related venue. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think Erin was already kind of thinking along those lines. She kind of wanted to go in there um, and kind of, you know, go through everything and pull out anything that looked historical, important, relevant, you know, and then after, you know, having a chance to go through it, then obviously have, you know, like a professional kind of come and clean the rest of it. But yeah, (laughs) yeah. Well, you, 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 you certainly have on the call here several people who in the world of architecture and archives would, would know what, what they're looking at. So I think that if Aaron and you feel comfortable with that at some point, it would be really great if you would share those things with us because I think that um, Gabor cared very much for his world um, in design and architecture, and and in a sense, the world of design and architecture did not love him back appropriately. And those mm-hmm. of us who, who know that are aware of it. it. It's always sort of bothered those of us who understood the great values of God work that, that transcend the kind of, uh, you know, work a day, nine to five kind of thing. Um, that certainly was the case for my dad. He certainly deeply understood God War's remarkable and unique gift to the world, which was not a normal gift. And it wasn't something you could fit into a, you know, put into a, fit into a, a desk that, you know, would, would be in the drafting room and would be expected to deliver certain things by a certain time. And that wasn't Gabor's thing. But that having been said, my dad certainly understood deeply that he had a great gift and an important gift. And, and that aspect of Gabor's life, his choice of architecture as a way of not only expressing himself, but a way of of um, thinking about thinking about the world and thinking about the human experience. Architecture played a great role in his philosophical thinking. That's something that I think that he he struggled himself trying to bring that to the to the broader audience. He brought it to each of us who knew him in one way or another individually, but he struggled with a way to bring that to a broader audience. But we who knew him and cared about him absolutely know that that's of value. So please, those of you who are directly associated with his estate, 
please reach out to us. Don't, don't leave us out. Um, we care about him. We love him. Even though he struggled with the world of, you know, sort of academia or standard architecture, what such, we're, 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 the people who are on this call are not part of that. We're just part of the club that loves Gabor. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't leave us out. Don't, don't think that he, you know, you understand him and we don't and blah, blah, blah. You know, that, that, that's a normal reaction that people have, I think. Um, we all feel that in one way or another. We had to, uh, each of us had a special piece of a very special man. Mm -hmm. But we should be able to share those things. And those of us who did understand him need to share it with, with the broader world because he had an important message um, that we don't want to be lost. So yeah. do let us be a part of that. Yeah, as, totally as agree. You, as yeah. you move forward, okay, and please please communicate that to Aaron. We 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 are his friends. That's why we're on this call. You know, I loved him very much. I have many recordings of his calls and and his experience of you know when I made the film My Architect, I arranged to interview him and had a whole crew and we came to Philadelphia. We were ready to shoot and he disappeared. And boy, was I mad at him for a couple of days. And then I understood. Well, that's Gabor. You know, he he said yes and then he didn't want to do it. So I, you know, I, I've come to accept that. And it, you know, in the end, it made, it made all the sense in the world, but at the time it made, <laughs> made me mad, but that's, but that's him, you know? So we, the people who are on this call understand him yeah. and, and we love him. So I just, I just want to sort of make that plea again, you know, as you go through those things, there is a great show to be had, a great story to be told, maybe even a book to be made that would involve things about Kabor and philosophy and architecture that I really would like to see happen. So you, you know where to find me, you know where to find Bill, where to find Gina, and I, I don't know, David, I think David might be there too. I know David cared about him a lot too. Nathaniel, um, I'm here. So, uh, this is David Oh, great. That's wonderful. I'm so, I'm so glad you're there, David. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you have some very, there's some very interesting people in this call. And I know there's some other architects there too. For those so of I don't, you who don't, don't know, you out know my it. name, most of you don't. Yeah. I'm a professor yeah. of architecture at, at Penn and have taught there Hi, since, David. Yes. Since, 19, Hi. Mm -hmm. since 1984. And uh, Gabor called me, um, I think it was about eight or nine days ago. Um, and we talked for quite some time. And mm. at some point in the conversation, he uh, was rather blunt and told me not to forget what he had told me. Uh, I took that as an indication that he would like us to remember. And I'm simply speaking up now to um, endorse what Nathaniel has said, that there is, um, there will be a desire in the future to know what this man said what he believed, uh, what he left behind. And if that could be shared uh, now for those interested, but I think also for those in future, uh, insofar as Khan thought so highly of him and the world of architecture thinks so highly of Khan, there will be an enduring interest in Gabor's writing, thinking, drawing, and whatever he uh, whatever remains of his contributions will be of interest. Um, and I think uh, that uh, the perpetuity of his thinking was important to, to Gabor himself. So uh, I'm fully in accord with, with what Nathaniel uh, has uh, asked for or um, recommended and whatever form makes sense to those who will decide these issues, I, I think um, it will be valuable to the architecture community and, and still more widely. Thank you. Hi, this is Gina Polera. Um, I met Gabor when the Khan show, The Power of Architecture, came to the Fabric Warehouse in Philadelphia. And of course, I had heard of him for many, many years. I um, led the construction effort to build the um, FDR Memorial that Khan designed. Uh, for the South Point of Roosevelt Island here in New York City. And uh, when I met Gabor, um, I was saying to Nathaniel, if, I don't remember what year it was, but it feels like it was 10 years ago. We had so many amazing conversations and 
it's interesting to me that I had absolutely no idea of this food connection because we never spoke about that. We talked a lot about architecture. And so there is, um, it's funny to me to hear about the macrobiotics, which was never part of our conversations. But, but the, um, his thinking about architecture and his provocations, I think, to, to Lou about architecture and, and about um, sort of the making of space is, is his way of thinking about that was really amazing and, and shouldn't be lost. And, and um, I think it, it's another facet of, um, of him that is important to, to commemorate and, and remember and, and share. So I would just, um, echo David and, and Nathaniel in saying that I think it's important we find a way to preserve and and share his thoughts about architecture. And so thank you for um, putting this together. And I felt it was very important for me to be here, even though I didn't know him um, chronologically for very many years, but I felt like I knew him for a long time. Thank you. Uh, I I wanted to say something because I I had a conversation along these lines of Gabor's uh, sketchbooks. Um, he had shared with me that it, he was not really universally loved in the office. Uh, as he told me, that there were other um, people working there that were jealous of him, jealous of the fact that he kind of came in there without a portfolio or anything. But he did have a sketchbook. He told me that um, we had a conversation about, he had asked me the question of how I got interested in becoming an architect. And then uh, he shared with me how he got interested in becoming an architect. And interestingly, we both started out kind of pre-med. His father was a physician um, and Gabor loved his father. He lost his father when he was six years old. So he had this deep spiritual connection to, to medicine and to healing. Um, and he said that he grew up loving to draw. He loved to draw these kind of illustrative, um, either anatomy, like he liked looking at the anatomy books and drawing, drawing anatomy. He liked to draw, uh, you know, plants and flowers kind of sorts of things. And um, he loved drawing motorcycles. So mm -hmm. he, he liked motorcycles. But I, I know that he's got sketchbooks. I know just from looking at his handwriting that the man had a, an amazing sense of line and, and, um, and a touch. So I'm sure that his drawings will be uh, will be very beautiful. I, uh, David Rulon, who spoke earlier, had taken some pictures of, you know, kind of a chalk on a on a dark background and and some studies in light, and and little little mountains made of the word yes. Um, he was extraordinarily uh, positive. Those, those words that he shared were all about this elevation and that this was a kind of our, our godly task of why, why we're here. Um, it's wonderful for me to have Nat, Nathaniel on the call and uh, David, who was one of my teachers. I don't know if you remember me, David. I was there from 83 to yes, I Yes, I do remember you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I took a year off from school, partly on Gabor's uh, urging, and went and, and studied with a, a Japanese um, uh, macrobiotic teacher named Noburo Muromoto in San Diego and went out there and kind of plunged into the world of macrobiotics. So I kind of bridged these worlds of, of architecture and, and food and, and understanding and 
Um, I again want to say that the website is meant to be a place where we can park these things, we can communicate with one another. I really don't want it to be about, I mean, I've put a lot of content in there, but I know a lot of other people can share stories. And as some of these artifacts hopefully come up, I hope that we can catalog them and, and put, put them there and then certainly find a home for the actual artifacts. Um, he loved Philadelphia. He very much loved his and was proud of the fact that he got to be part of Khan's office because he discovered architecture out of a love of nature and medicine, but he loved art and he had this uh, passion of discovering essence and a great care with choosing words that was highly unusual. Um, no one really communicated the way he did. Uh, Chris Taylor, I see Chris, um, offered, hi Chris, offered up a couple of recordings that I put on the website. So it's lovely to hear Gobbler's voice. I've got a couple of, um, voicemails that I may put on there as well. Um, just to hear his voice and hear the way he spoke was it just it just brings it literally to me brings him back to life. It's hard for me to believe that he's gone uh, when I when I hear his voice. Um, the last time I saw him was in like maybe 30 years ago. So he certainly changed. Uh, and I've certainly changed. Um, when I met him, I think I was 29. And he was about 46 in one of those late night uh, studio meetings. But I, I wanted to mention, I know that in that somewhere in that in, in his apartment, I'm sure there are sketchbooks. And um, uh, I know that stuff is here and I'm talking to Aaron about that. I'm just happy that those things get placed in a box. Gobbler expressed to me that he wanted his belongings to, um, I mean, he knew that he was not long uh, to be in his bio pajama that he was going to step into the another dimension and as he put it and so he had talked about his his uh desire to have his belongings he said could just go to the salvation army he didn't care he wanted to be cremated he wanted his ashes put under a tree he wanted a stone engraved with those with those words that i mentioned but other than that i think that um you know, a man's life also belongs to to those of us who knew him and to the world. And I think it really is important. That's why I wanted to create this website and, and build it around these different facets of the man and, and uh, the words that he spoke. Um, all these projects, I mean, mentioning that carrot juice reminded me of we were making this concoction he called Prima. We were calling it Prima, which was brown rice, sea salt and carrot juice. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Okay, did anyone else want to share anything? Um, unfortunately, I have to go back to bed. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to thank you all. It's been fantastic to listen to what people have had to say. And I would like to continue to contribute in whatever way I can. So I'll keep an eye on the website. Um, and I think um, it's been just amazing to listen to what people have had to say. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your contrib contribution. So I will lovely, love you and leave you. Um, and we will no doubt speak again. So take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Um, we can, we can, Matt, um, sort of just end with like a silent prayer. Um, and then I'll put out the candles before they burn down my house. <laughs> so um, just for a couple minutes, if you want to just. Sherry, can you hear me? Oh, you want to say something? Okay. Yes. Okay, go uh, ahead. My name is Peru Lafiel. I'm calling from Oslo. Oh. It's four, four o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. Um, I was a student of Khan in 1972. And then I got to meet Gabor, which was a fantastic 
experience that uh, has never left me mm. four years ago now. Uh, I met him a couple of times later. Uh, but what amazes me is sort of the way he talked and the way he, in which each of his words had sort of a, a very much a content of its own, meaning when you listen to him, he always gave you something back that you have either not heard before or that uh, sort of make your, broaden your mind in a sense. And I'm very thankful then to having, being able to um, listen to him and listen to him, him in the way that one through his words also understood oneself better. So thank you very much, Gabor, for that. And thank you for being able to listening in to these stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else before we end in some silence? Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. Matthew for putting this together. This is wonderful. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please, please visit the website. Please contribute, comment, contact me. I have the contact information on the site. Okay, so if we can just take a couple minutes of silence and prayer, it's always good to um, send him some energy so he can move on and continue to inspire us from the other side. Okay, I'm going to put out the candles. I, I did want to share one thing. Gabor told me that he was prepared to answer two questions when he got to where he was going on the other side. And one of the questions was, what have you done in my name? And the second question was, do you want to stay here? Now, I know that what he did in, in the name of God, if you will, was that he reached out, he cared about others, he had this great compassion, and all these projects that I know that I'd like to share and put on the website. But I know that he told me that he's coming back. <laughs> He said it would probably take him 20 or 25 years to emerge, but he was going to find a new body. <laughs> he's coming back. He's not done. So I just wanted to mention that. So if you get a phone call next week. <laughs> no, he said 20, 25 years. It's going to take a little while to emerge as a teacher. You know, he wants to teach. Continue teaching. Mm. <laughs> Maybe he'll show up at Penn again, 25 years. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and stay in touch. <laughs> and make sure you visit the website. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be sending the recording out tomorrow. So thank much. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.